Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Colonel Andrew Jingaleski. He's got a very interesting education that includes a Master's of Military Arts and Science from the U.S. Army School of Advanced Military Studies. That's the closest real thing we have to Jedi School, and its graduates are colloquially known as Jedi Knights. And he's currently pursuing an MS in National Security Strategy from the National War College. His fields of study and his extensive experience give him an insight on the complexities of societal dynamics on international relations. For instance, how does the recent viral growth of the middle class in China impact their government's behavior towards the rest of the world? How does tradition influence their approach to resource acquisition in Africa compared to ours? What complexities are we going to have to face as we see the economic rise of countries whose influence in their regions grow? And what's the right way to encourage stability in those areas? Colonel Jingaleski is a hero, not just for volunteering to serve our country, but for doing so with a dizzying intellect and an unapologetic candor. He gets into it with Pete and today's co-host, our friend Will Hardy. Thanks, Pete, Will, and Colonel Jingaleski for sharing and exploring these insights and making us all better informed. Everybody, please enjoy our guest today, Colonel Andrew Jingaleski. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Andy Jingleski, and this is The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, this is cool. We got one of these strategy shows that you guys all love. And so we've got Colonel Andy, as I call him on the show. He and I see the combat world in a lot of the same ways, except for he actually still works trying to figure out what's next. Highly, highly educated guy. And then we're also joined by my co-host, someone who's been on the show before, Will Hardy, who also works on really what's next. And so we're going to try to give you all a sneak peek into the problems that we're trying to solve. And and I'm going to tell you right now, like, from a, a <laughs> Andy talked about proclivity and, and a lack of desire to serve from the next generation, Generation Z, and also like the the toll taken on personnel by our long protracted wars. So this is going to be an interesting conversation. Um, Andy, I want to start with that 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 thing of we've worn the service members out. You know, like when when people talk about females in combat, and I'll just say up front, I'm totally for it because. Everywhere I've, you know, here's, here's, as a guy that's been out of the wire as much as anybody else ever, um, here's my demands. Either be a pro or trying to be a pro. If you're a woman, if you're a trans, I don't care. And when people talk about injuries, I'm going to tell you who gets hurt in a combat zone. Everybody. That's so right. everybody's getting hurt. They get worn out. We got SEALs quitting being a SEAL at 12, 15 years of service. And that's just like, you're so close to the finish line, but they've already reached it. Talk to me a little bit from the perspective that you work at and maybe give us an idea of what your perspective level is so the audience can track that with us. But give us an idea of what the roadmap looks like or, or as we look back to assess, what are we seeing? Yeah, sure. So right now I'm a, I'm a full-time student at the National War College at Fort McNair in uh, Washington, D.C. It's the uh, it's the joint and interagency war college. So we have 50 percent U.S. military, 25 percent um, U.S. federal civilians. So we have you know, the intel agencies, we've got Department of Energy, State, Homeland Security, you, you name it. It's the alphabet soup. They're there. And then we've got 25 percent foreign officers. Um, so it's a very unique school. It's unlike any of the other war colleges. Um, uh, I, I also served for three years on the on the joint staff working for General Dunford and the uh, the war plans division where I was the uh, the PACOM war planner. So I had the uh, the. Uh, the Korea and China portfolios, which was, was very interesting, especially with the, um, you know, when President Trump was elected and, and that, that period of very high tension uh, before the first, um, the first summit where we were escalating, uh, doing some things to, to put some pressure to get the North Koreans to the, the negotiating table. Um, and then before that, I worked for the chief of the National Guard Bureau right after he uh, was named to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So I worked directly for him on his strategic initiatives group. Uh, it's actually called the um, the Chiefs Action Group. 
for two years. So I spent the last uh, five, six years at, at very high levels working strategy and, and uh, operational planning. Um, I went to the School of Advanced Military Studies in the Army, uh, graduated in 2010. And then I went to Afghanistan and I was actually the, uh, the lead planner for the first drawdown, which was had the wonderful euphemism, the surge recovery. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can't call it a withdrawal. It's a surge no. recovery. Right. <laughs> Recover you. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think the, uh, the, the protracted nature of the, the conflicts in the Middle East, North Africa, it's not just the people, it's the equipment, it's everything. You know, one of the things that, uh, we, we've been seeing is the problems with recruiting, especially for the ground forces, uh, the Marines just started uh, retention bonuses for the second time in their history. And when the Marines are offering retention bonuses, that means you've got a problem. Yeah. Because, the, Boy. because the, the, the Marines don't offer recruiting bonuses. You join to become a Marine, full stop. Uh, it doesn't matter what, what job you have in the Marines. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be a Marine. And so if they're, they're short in certain career fields, that's a really bad sign. Um, the Army is the same thing. The Navy is the same thing. The Air Force is the same thing. The Air Force is short. And you can, this is all publicly available not, um, information, by the way. Again, you can Google this up and, and find all of this out. But, you know, the, uh, the Air Force, for example, is 1,300 pilots short, of which half of which are fighter pilots. So you have the question, you know, what are the dynamics where you can't fill your fighter pilots? Arguably the second most glamorous job, you know, next to astronaut in the country, you know. Is, is it an organizational culture thing? Is it an operations tempo thing? Is it the airlines offering um, a lot of money to, to become a pilot and, and work a lot less? You know, you're only working two weeks out of a month as an airlines pilot. It's probably a combination of all those things. Um, but it's, it's all taken a toll. And so, you know, the last 20 years, 19 years of, of conflict, now all of a sudden you have a resurgence in Russia and a rising China. So what do you have to do about them? Okay. That's why the last national military strategy was focused on great power competition. It's how do we take, how do we, how do we secure NATO? How do we maintain our relationship with NATO? How do we deter the Russians from any further aggression? Because the Russians' aim is quite quite simple. They want to defend their. I mean, these are these are traditional, you know, Russian strategy. They want to defend the near abroad because they always want to have a buffer state because they've been <laughs> pretty much invaded by everybody in Europe. Sure. And, and in Asia as well. But they also, you know, since the since NATO was created, they're always looking at ways to to divide NATO in some way. And right now, you see that most most um, potently, I think, with Turkey. You know, they want to sell advanced air, air defense missiles to Turkey. That will be a real problem if that's allowed to occur. So it's it's a really interesting state of affairs to be in the military right now at a, at a high level because there's so many different sources of pressure um, from so many different places. I, I absolutely agree with you, Andy, that we, we aren't prepared for what's next and um, – what we need to do. One of the things that I've been working on um, through my day job is really trying to understand what the competition phase means for the U.S. military and how we can actually engage in the competition phase that is uh, actually competitive with what our um, other nations are doing. So what China and what Russia may be doing fall outside of the scope of what we traditionally think of as military activities. So we're, we're having to wrestle with what can we actually do? What, what effect can we have? And are we, are we manned? Are we, do we have the technology to um, achieve that effect? And so that's, that's one of the big challenges I see coming up. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a great point because, you know, the, um, the United States government was never designed to be inefficient, to be efficient. It was designed to be inefficient, you know, with three, three competing uh, branches acting as counterbalances, right? We don't have to worry about that with Russia and China. And so, you know, with the, the Russians and the Chinese, you're right. They're doing a lot of things using their intelligence agencies, using economic power, using the power of information and propaganda, which really don't fall within what we view as, as 
you know, military operations or military strategy. It's, and I think that's deliberate because they, they think they see um, the combat experience of, of the United States over the last 20 years. And they say, look, if we try and get into a, a battle of attrition, it's not going to go very well for us. You know, so what are the ways that we can utilize other instruments of power to uh, to weaken the United States? And that's where, you know, the China, to me, China uses their economy. Um, interesting story. Uh, back in 2015, we had the, uh, the, the the J5 of the Australian Defense Force. What What uh, is come, a J5? J5 is their, their um, chief of strategic planning. And so... He, uh, he came over and he said something that, that still to this day kind of boggles my mind. He said that every fruit and vegetable that's produced in Australia that's not earmarked for domestic consumption is exported to one place, and that's China. And so when you take a look at what the Chinese are doing, they're expanding economically to get their hooks into countries by uh, um, some really sketchy loans. But what, what they promise is, is, look, you get access to a market with 1.3 billion people. And so, you know, as a, if you're working in a capitalist society, that's a very appealing market for you because you can sell a whole lot of stuff there. And that's happening over and over and over again. And the other, the other issue with the Chinese, which I think is really interesting, is, you know, if you have growth in their middle class, let's say it's something like, a small number, let's say 3% of the, the population uh, migrates from the lower class to the middle class. And recognizing that the, the way that we define lower class and middle class isn't the same as, as what the Chinese would, but that is a huge tax on resources for the Chinese, right? Because these people are going to demand more money, better health care, better food, better quality of life. So how do they ensure those sorts of resources are available all the time, which is why they've got their hooks in Africa so deeply because they're getting all the natural resources and all materials out of Africa and they want to protect it. Right. That's why they're building this, this new Silk Road and all the ports, you know, along the, uh, the Indian Ocean and, and uh, you know, Gadar and Pakistan and Colombo and Sri Lanka, and the South China Sea. It's designed to protect that trade coming into the country. When you look at China's strategic goals, keeping its investment in Africa secure, trying to support a, a massive middle-class growth that they're going to obviously have. How often do their goals line up? What's the Venn diagram between us and them? Like, How often are we in agreement or at least out of each other's way enough that we don't have to be content? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good question. Um, so my, my dad was a CEO of a, of a bank, um, trade finance bank and, and dealt all over the world, primarily Middle East and Africa. I remember a number of years ago, um, before he retired, he had said, you know, with the uh, the Sudanese oil market, um, we actually, the, the, the Western companies wanted the Chinese to go in there and, and, and utilize that market because what they wanted to do is reduce the friction of competition between the Western oil companies and the Chinese. Say, so, hey guys, you can, have, you can have the Sudan, you know, it's a landlocked country, it's not really easy to get, well, I don't think it's landlocked, they have access to the Red Sea, but it's really quite difficult. They don't have a great infrastructure to get the oil out to the sea, so you have to make investments there. You can have this. When I was a command in general staff college in 2008, we had the president of Uganda speak to us. He was very happy with the Chinese. Now, he was a Marxist, so there's some, <laughs> some, some ideological uh, uh, underleaning there, but what he basically said was like, hey, look, you know, the Chinese come in and they want certain things. You know, they want access to raw materials. But what they do is they come in, they will uh, teach my people, give them jobs, they'll develop the infrastructure. And as long as we, we can ensure the flow of materials back to China, they're pretty happy. Now, they're starting to see some ill effects, not just with Uganda, but other countries in um in, in Africa with, with the predatory loans where it's, it's being held over their head um, if they're not, not paying them off in time. One other thing that's very interesting about the Chinese in Africa is that, actually really the Chinese everywhere, is they, they lead economically and then they follow militarily. Right. So look, they, they go in economically first and there's a, there's a lag five, seven, 10 years before they start 
I mean, that's what he did in South Sudan. There's a uh, there's a reinforced battalion of Chinese peacekeepers in Sudan now. You know, everybody everybody talks about Djibouti and the port of Djibouti that's being built up by the Chinese. We do it the opposite way. We want to get in militarily, and then we'll follow economically. And I'm not really sure that plays very well with the Africans. I mean, again, um, there's a reason why Africom's headquarters isn't on the continent of Africa, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, there wasn't a great deal of desire to have an American uh, command on the continent. And that really says something because, you know, the Africa is such a, un, it's such an amazing place. I've been there twice um, and, and to, to, to Morocco and Egypt. It, it's so varied whether you go to East Africa, West Africa, Southern Africa, you know, into the Maghreb, the, the, the cultures are different, the people are different, the tribes are different. And so for every country there to say, hey, look, we really don't want an American headquarters there, that's pretty, that's a yeah. pretty solid sign that you're not doing something right. I don't know what that is, but you're, you're probably not doing something that, that jives with the African desires too much. Right. We, we attach too many strings when we say, hey, we want to do something. And the Chinese, um, as, as you alluded to, they don't attach many strings. They just, you know, we will do we will invest in you as long as you can um, return our investment. That's so right. make sure the the extraction of goods are headed towards us. I, I think China, China, I've, I've just been uh, lately diving into China and it's it's kind of blowing my mind because everybody always says they want to change the system. They're they're wanting to change the economic system. But they take a completely different approach than Russia. Like Russia wants to take down the current economic system because they view it as a, a challenge. China is actually gaining influence within the current system to evolve it. Like they, they have more. There are more Chinese UN peacekeepers than any other nation. They have. Um, they they invest, as you mentioned, Andy. They invest a ton in developing countries. But then on the other hand, China also receives receives more um, loans and more grants from the IMF than any other country too. So it's, it's they're, they're really working the system and changing the system from the inside. So the, they fascinate me. I, I, and I just know I'm not smart enough to truly comprehend what they're doing. Well, I thought, what, you know, I've learned quite a bit about this over the last five years. And, and the best thing that we can come up with is both the Chinese and the Russians are trying to form, and this is classic communist doctrine, um, going all the way back into, you know, Leninist times, is that what they're trying to do is form parallel systems. Okay, they don't agree with, you know, the liberal international order that was established by the United States after World War II because it doesn't give them the amount of power or prosperity or influence that they desire. So how do you, you can fight against that or you can develop alternate systems, parallel systems, try and get countries to buy into that as an alternative to what you know the US and Western Europe are, have been doing for, for 60, 70 years now. And I think that's what we're seeing, especially economically with the, the new Silk Road um, the Russians have, I forgot what it's called, but it's a Central Asian trade agreement. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the, the Russians and the Chinese have signed gas and oil pipeline deals um, for, for Russian gas and oil to go into China now. Um, there's, there's, there's railroads going from China all the way into Germany now. You, you can travel, I mean, and there's not a whole lot of traffic on them yet, but it's there and it's, it's, it's just a matter of time until a lot of the goods that are being produced and in, in even as far away as Western Europe are able to go to China via rail. That's pretty an amazing, it's a pretty amazing accomplishment when you think how quickly that happened. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When you look at these kind of strategic situations that exist, I mean, obviously we have our approach, Europe has it, you know, China and Russia are definitely going to do their own thing. India Everybody's sort of playing at this level, but that does seem that globally we're dealing with a higher level of problem. I mean, I'm not saying that nobody's starving in Africa and there's not a big, a lot of big problems, but 20 years ago we were talking about totally different things. Yes. So is this, is this a byproduct of, and I'm going to take a lot of credit here on our behalf, but <laughs> is this a byproduct of the stability that we ultimately earned after world war two? And I know that's a really big, big, statement but 
is this good competition and a result of getting to a better place where, you know, the middle class in China actually fucking that fact that it exists, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Western Europe, I guess the best way to describe it is this. The system has worked well enough for enough people. When I say the system, I mean the, the U.S. led liberal international order since the end of World War II. That has worked well enough for enough people for a long enough period of time that they generally buy into it because it's a benefit to them. They don't see it. Yeah, there may be negatives in some ways, but in general, it's seen as positive. I mean, Western Europe, the reason why they have all of these um, youth sp social spending programs is because they don't have to sink all the costs into their military because we've basically done that for them. We said, hey, we're, we're generally going to underwrite Western Europe security especially since the end of the cold war uh since the end of the cold war you know that when you take a look at some of the um again th this is amazing because this was only t you know 30 years ago you have the british army of the rhine you've got a, you know canadian divisions in germany you have belgian divisions in germany um, you have two american corps in germany and all of that gets removed in the 90s so all this is being being underwritten. And what's happened is like, you know, economically with the Chinese, we've helped finance them. Right? I mean, I, I think it was Clinton who granted them most favored trade nation right. status. Right. And so, yeah, absolutely. What the Chinese are saying are, look, hey, you're going to do this. We're going to benefit. You're going to benefit. But at a certain point, and by the way, you know, if, if you go into international uh, relations theory and, and and political science, you see this. It, it happens every century where you have rising powers and declining powers, rising powers and declining powers. And I'm not saying we're declining. We're not. It's just that the, the Chinese especially are rising and you're going to get friction there. So the point is, you know, where where does that friction lead to? You know, what comes next? And that's the real problem that we, we're, we're trying to figure out is, if you look historically, most of those frictions lead to major power war. The the, the notable um, exception is the rise of the U.S. against England uh, in the 19th century. And England basically says, hey, look, we have this global empire we have to maintain. And United States, former colony, revolted against this, but they speak English. You know, they're generally mostly European. This is okay. And we don't want to get into a war with them because you've already gotten into two, 1776, 1783, and then War of 1812 to 1814. So they actually help, I won't say accommodate our rise, but they tolerate it. And then by, I mean, here's the interesting thing about the British Empire. The British, the British um, politicians, the prime ministers of the 1890s, they knew that the empire was economically unsustainable as early as the 1890s. Hmm. Uh, just because the cost of, of stationing troops overseas and having a huge navy that had to keep, you know, all these coaling ports operating. Um, so it's uh, that that to me is where the, the, the friction and where this this tension is going to lie is how how dominant do we really want to be? How accommodating do we want to be? And then the other the other big fear that you have and I, I just mentioned this in, in class a couple of days ago, is the Chinese Communist Party under Xi Xi has never faced a serious crisis, whether it's internal or external, it doesn't matter. So we don't know how they're going to react, hmm. right? right? And so if they have a, you know, Xi basically, you know, does a, um, you know, Papa, Papa Doc Duvalier declares himself president for life. Okay, well, how does that work when your economy starts tanking? PRC. How does that work when you get into a, um, you know, small-scale naval battle in, in the uh, in the South China Sea, and you've just lost a number of destroyers and frigates, you know, because everybody looks at, everybody views the Communist Party as being um, monolithic, and you know, a great deal of solidarity. It's not like that, okay? It's not like that. There's a great deal of competition, and there are people within the senior ranks of the Chinese Communist Party, who will gladly use something bad going uh, against China's um, foreign policy and, and weaponize that against Xi. So that's the other thing that you have to be concerned about is what happens when you get China into a crisis mode? We don't know how they're going to react. And I'll tell you, that scares a lot of people, and it should. So one of the fascinating things I, I find about um, President Xi is, it, I don't know what the Chinese call their state of a union, 
state of the union, but they, in his most recent uh, speech that he gave to the country about the direction of the country and um, the strategic interests, a lot of the focus was on domestic issues, like yeah. combating regionalism, it, ensuring that the the crisis in the West, so the Uyghurs, doesn't uh, rise up and damage them internally or damage their standing externally on the international sphere. And the other thing that they he focuses on is not having more of a reach, but consolidating what they view as already theirs. So like the Spratly Islands, the, the Chinese would never say that they're contested it's rightly theirs and they're just trying to consolidate it so a, a lot of times when i hear people say that china is just this great threat that's going to challenge us around the world i i look at what the chinese are actually saying and it, they don't look like they are a threat that has much of a reach they they seem to be postured more defensively to me with with i would agree with that with their military forces they are trying to develop you know some offensive capability with the blue water navy but you know their strategic bombing fleet is archaic it's ancient um it's small their icbm fleet is very small i think they only have four four missile boats uh four boomers um but i, I think you're right will because when you take a look at what they're really developing what they're I th is my opinion um, as you all, this is my opinion. None of this is the official U.S. government or, or DOD's uh, stance. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, I, I think what the, the Chinese are doing is they're trying to build a layered defense, right? If you take a right. look at some of their advanced missile programs, like the DF-21, which they call the carrier killer, supposedly has a 3,000-kilometer three kilom three range, and they have lesser missiles. So if, you know, lesser range missiles... So, what they're trying to do is to have this layered defense before the mainland because uh, they see the, the United States Navy and the United States Air Force, and quite rightly, as, as being a major threat to them. So how do, you, how do you counter that? How do you neutralize that? How do you slow that, that pace of operations down, you know, which is why they've invested so much in the cyber, the second, the second PLA, uh, People's Liberation Army. They're the hackers. You know, they have regiments of hackers. They will be used um, to hack anything of ours that's not secure, you know, and it's all designed to delay, to obscure, to make make life miserable for us. But again, I think it's a, a militarily, I think it's a defensive posture. Economically, it's very, very different. It's very offensive. Right. You know, especially with their ground forces. You know, People Liberation's Army is not an expeditionary force. It's just not. I mean, when you have 1.3 billion people, um, the army is, is, is designed for internal control. It's been that way since at least the 50s, you know, since the end of the Korean War. You know, they, they, they've kind of, I, I would say if there's any overlap between the Russians and the Chinese, it's there, is that they, they are very concerned about protecting their periphery, right? You know, there's, um, that's why Korea is such a big deal to them. Mm-hmm. Right, is because they they view um, China. China views Korea as the ear, right? And if you lose your ear, they're in your head. Mm -hmm. You know, so they want to keep they want to keep America as far away from the head as possible. So it's really interesting stuff. When you look at our foreign policy as it sits right now, and you know, President Trump comments aside, like just the, the overall multi administrational approach. Are we, are we being too aggressive then? I mean, you know, obviously we're the, we're the number one world power, but we also have a lot of financial benefit in partnering with us. Uh, nobody wants to see a nuclear ICBM capable North Korea. This episode of the Break It Down show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG 69 at the Break It Down show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Uh, nobody wants to see a nuclear ICBM capable North Korea. How, are we approaching this in the right way or, or what do you think? 
Well, it depends what your objectives are, right? I mean, if your if your objectives are to, you know, maintain your status as, you know, maintain your, maintain your status as the hyperpower in a unipolar world, then the last 20 years makes a lot of sense. You know, if you're if you have, you know, Al Qaeda ramming airliners into the World Trade Center and into um, into the Pentagon, well, you have to do something about that. That's completely unacceptable if you were the hyperpower. You know, you need to blow these people to oblivion, and then when the dust settles, blow that dust into oblivion as well, just to send a message, right? If that's not the case, and you're willing to go back to a, a bipolar or multipolar world, which, by the way, is how Putin and Xi definitely see the world, um, they, they definitely want this multipolar world where you go back to the classical spheres of influence, where the Russians have the sphere of influence, you know, the, the Chinese have a sphere of influence, the United States has a sphere of influence. I don't think that's a very popular way to perceive the world in Washington, D.C. over the last 20 years, and certainly not right now. Uh, right. I think. I, th I think that kind of leads to a lot of the um, a lot of the the political tension that the president has to face with every day is that you have a, a let's face it you have a large foreign policy and military establishment that this has been their way of life since 1947, right? And so now if you have a president that comes in and says, "Hey, look, maybe we should be doing some things different here," people are so I don't think. You know, I'm, I'm not a believer in the deep state, but people are so ingrained with this level of thinking designed to, you know, promote and, and maintain the liberal international order that we've established that doing something that would, um, I don't even know, th threaten isn't even the right, wor right word, maybe even change it a little bit. They're, they're not really even willing to, to, to look at that seriously. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, tanker jokes aside and everything, when we do look at what the fight easily could be, it doesn't often look like tanks and battleships and, you know, airplanes flying in the sky. It's some some kind of different fight, whether it's hybrid or multi-domain or whatever terms we want to use. That doesn't sound like something the military-industrial complex likes. You know, they want to have this foundry here and this shipyard here and this training center here. And, and representatives get elected, for the most part, by creating high-paying jobs. And, heck, the military-industrial complex has a lot of those. I mean, imagine imagine what happens in the Gulf Coast if a lot well, of those jobs go away. Right, and especially right. In, in, in locations where they're at, right? And, I mean, Lima Tank Plant, it's the last tank plant we have in Lima, Ohio. If that goes away, well, you don't have a place where you can produce tanks any longer. Aniston, Aniston Army Depot down in Alabama can refurbish them, but they can't build them from scratch. Right. So are you willing to lose that capability? You know, I think there's only two or three shipyards that, that can produce um, capital class ships for us. There's only two or three shipyards that can build and maintain submarines. So it's that that's a whole that that in itself is a very interesting strategic discussion is, you know, wh where 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 does that tension take you to in the long run? You know, yeah. if you're if you're spending you know, we use the, the, the greatest example of them all, the B-2. If you're spending $2 billion on a single plane, well, guess what? It can't be manufactured quickly. Yeah. You know, so you're basically you're creating, as Martin Van Creffeld, the Israeli military historian, says you're basically creating, you know, custom works of art. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. and, it, and and when you lose it, like the, the B-2 that crashed in Guam, that's an, that's an irreplaceable loss. Yeah. It cannot be replaced. That's why the F-22 is being stationed at Tyndall, it just blew my mind. I got into a really big argument with an Air Force colonel over this saying, look, the, F the F-22 is not in production any longer. It's your premier fighter. Why would you put it in a place where you know it's going to get hit by a hurricane? I mean, that'd be today or tomorrow. And then if you know it's going to get hit by a hurricane, why don't you spend on the infrastructure to put it in bunkers that can withstand a Cat 5 hurricane? Yeah. Right? I mean, come on. Think about this. This is not it's, – it's not rocket surgery. If it was, I wouldn't be doing it. And by the way, you rounded down. That's a two point two billion dollar plane. That's just to buy it, not to maintain it or anything else. It's hey, 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 look, like Everett Dirksen said, a billion here and a billion there, and pretty soon you're talking about real money. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. That's, that's, <laughs> so one of the things about these shows is to give our listeners some ideas. And we we get into some jargon, but most everybody I think can follow. But uh, a friend of mine who who I'm always interested in what he has to say. He's a uh, Occupy Wall Street guy. Uh, has an anarchy <laughs> tattoo on his wrist or on his on his forearm, 
But he means well. He's trying to understand. So he puts up a meme that shows a uh, basically a Spectre gunship flying, and he's like, "This thing costs however much, but but there are there you know we have to we don't have free access to insulin, and uh, you know we're drowning in college debt." You know, you're talking about in this case a sixty three dollar sixty three million dollar airplane. Sure. But um, it's a reasonable question for someone who's not aware of all of the different things out there. I guess two part question is, is one, what do you think our big threat is? Do we need less C one thirties in the air or at least, you know, weapons capable C one thirties or, you know, fine cargo planes, whatever. But how do we answer people that have this legitimate beef with why are we spending $2.2 billion? Hell a trillion plus dollars and all the new Navy ships that apparently are, are not, you know, they're not, they're yeah, not. the four class carrier can't doesn't work. It's electromagnetic right. catapult isn't working correctly. Um, yes. No, I, I always go back to. Um, I think the last great president we had uh, was President Eisenhower, and, and there's very specific reasons for this. Eisenhower, being you know a um, a former five star general, knew the intricacies of the military inside and out, and you know everybody talks about his you know congressional, industrial, military, and uh, speech that he gave on his farewell address. Go back a little bit. The one I think that's more interesting is the cross of iron speech where he basically says, you know, for every tank and every ship that the United States produces, that's a, um, that's a, you know, six hospitals that aren't being built, 25 schools that aren't being built. I'm just paraphrasing, but that's the cost of this, right? Is when you're spending on DOD, a huge amount of your discretionary funding, in the nation, you know, seven, I think they're asking for 750 billion this year. What are the things that don't take place? What, what, what are you, you know, what's the opportunity cost there? What are you not getting? Right. Right. And so that, that's the real problem. And the, the other real problem is before you go past that though, I, yeah. I want to also like, cause everything's a dichotomy, right? This is yeah, also right. the same dude that him and Nixon, when they were, you know, having their administration together are saying these things. And they're like, by the way, we're going to dump a bunch of military industrial complex jobs into California. And like they created tens of thousands of jobs in the state on the very same backbone, you know, of military industrial complex. So it's, 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 it's never a simple black or white thing. Here's a guy that sees this, but still has to create it. Right. And, and, if, if you, I, th- I think it really comes down to this, Pete. If you view the liberal international order that we've created, you know, at the end of World War II and, and in the early Cold War, if you believe that is more beneficial to the United States, to the Western democracies, there's a cost for that, right? Yeah. And, and that's scalable, right? It, you know, you get up, you know, go from Bill Clinton and the peace dividend where, you know, the, the military budget's 350, 360 a year. You know, it obviously ramps up in Vietnam. It ramps up in Korea. So to me, the question is, are, are we buying the right stuff, hmm. right? Are, are the things that we are buying today, because to me, the, the way that I view our current procurement is the only, we're doing incremental upgrades, Right. You know, I'll give you something as, as benign as the M777 howitzer, uh-huh. right? M777 howitzer, great piece of kit, okay? There's, an, a, there's a new version coming out that's going to have a 40-mile-plus range, right? But guess what? It's still a howitzer. Yeah. You know, it just has a it, – it's, it's, it's made of titanium, so it can be slung, long, slung loaded under a helicopter, um, but it's still firing 155-millimeter round, rocket-propelled. Um, in some cases, GPS guided in some cases, but it's the same technology that's been used since World War II. It's just been incre- incrementally approved over time, right? Tanks, um, you know, the new the new version, the M1A3, or the, I forgot what it's called, the M1A2 SIP version two is a, a new tank that's gonna be coming out in the next couple of years for the army. At a certain point, you can't make a tank any more protective or any more lethal than, than what we're going to do because it's just going to become too heavy. Right. And so if it becomes too heavy, you have the same problem that the Germans have, right? So they build tigers 
and they build, you know, the Koenigsteiger, the King Tiger. They build a couple prototypes of the mouse, and okay, great, you can stink this honking huge cannon on there, and you can have this incredible protection. But oh, by the way, you can't go over any bridges because you're going to collapse them. Yeah. You know, you, you know, you can't use blow boys because the the truck axles don't support the PSI. Yeah. You know, and don't the, you the, dare put one accidentally in a river that we can't get out and it gets ruined, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, right. Yeah. Right. So to, to me, that's, I mean, there, there's a, you know, I think you, you guys may have seen it over the last couple of days, but Mattis, one of the things that he was getting into an argument about with the Navy was, why are we investing 15 to $20 billion in new aircraft carriers per ship, per ship, when you may have a threat out there that, that, makes them not, not, not survivable. I mean, here's something crazy about the Navy. This, this absolutely blows my mind. And I didn't realize this until I was on the joint staff and I had four Navy guys working for me. I spent very little time with the Navy. The Navy has no in-fueling capability, right? no in-service refueling capability right now. They don't have a dedica dedicated aircraft to refuel their own aircraft. Because over the last 20 years, they've become so reliant on Air Force tankers flying over the Middle East, that they can launch off the aircraft carriers, get gassed up going in, get gassed up on the way out. So they said, hey, you know what? We're just not going to buy anything. So what they've been forced to do is take F-18s. Again, you can find all this on the internet. It's out yeah. there. Take F-18s, strip them down to bare bones, throw a couple of drop tanks on there, and use the F other F-18s as refueling birds. Wow. Right. It is yes. a multi-platform platform. platform. <laughs> right, yeah. Right. There you go. I mean, that's that's madness. And so again, it goes what what you know, what are the things that are are really what are the things that we have to invest in? And this is a really hard question. I mean, I know Mattis Mattis had a special task force that was looking at this um you know, when he was the SecDef. What are the things that we absolutely have to invest in? The things that are, you know, game-changing um, technologies. That's a that's a lot of weight to, to to carry because if if you get it wrong, you know, who knows what the consequences are going to be? Yeah. If you say, hey, look, tanks aren't going to be survivable because of you know tandem warhead technology or a top-down attack like the Javelin or the Cornet, um, and, and, and it's just going to be too heavy to produce tanks. Or if you say, look, the, the cost benefit of having F-18s flying off carriers isn't worth the squeeze because they have short legs and, you know, you don't have the in, in-flight capa uh, in fueling capacity um, within the service. If you get that wrong, you have real problems. And so it's really a strategic risk assessment that has to go along with with what you're doing here, which is, okay, if I have to go up against China or Russia, which I think is highly unlikely militarily because of nuclear weapons that both sides possess, and also because of the Chinese economic tendrils that stretch into everything we do. But if I have to go fight these folks at some point, how, is that, how does that look? And I don't, I don't think anybody has a real good idea of how that looks right now, because you're dealing with, number one, the Russians the Russians are a bit of a paper tiger, okay? Right. They have some ground forces that are very good, but most of their force isn't. Most of their ground forces isn't. There was a report that they had when they uh, went into eastern Ukraine, they had to move uh, Marine Brigade all the way from Vladivostok into eastern Ukraine because that was one of the few force, one of the few. Uh, units that actually could could fight i mean that's like a six thousand mile rail railroad right oh my god how hard is that militarily right shit yeah and oh by the way the trans-siberian railroad is only a two-track railroad right it's got <laughs> one going one way and one going the other way yeah and and oh by the way it's siberia so you better do it in the right time of year or you're you're or have special plow trains right so what the russians have done and it's very very i mean it's, it's so russian right but it's a beautiful play. They're playing a they're playing a poor hand strongly, which is, hey, look, I'm going to leak out that I'm going to develop all these hypersonic weapons, and I'm going to let it leak out that I've got, you know, a, a intercontinental torpedo, nuclear torpedo that can be launched from 3,000 miles away under sea. Even if it doesn't work, even if they don't have it, there's a huge deterrent effect, right? 
a huge deterrent effect. And so what do you need to invest in? Because you're two different threats. You know, the, the Russians are, are primarily going to be a land threat with their near abroad and the Chinese, and this is why you see the push to a blue water Navy, they just want to secure the commons. They just want to secure the South China Sea and get outside the nine dash line, right? So that's why you see the friction points with the Senkakus. I mean, the Senkakus are worthless. There's no potable water, right? And it's, that's why, I mean, and then, and, and same thing with the, with the, uh, with the, the Spratleys and all the islands that they've built in the South China Sea. Militarily, they're useless. You know, when you think about it, we didn't take every island in the Pacific during World War II, right? We did island hopping. We looked for certain islands that had strategic and operational value, and we prioritized the taking of those because, I don't know, like with Iwo Jima and Okinawa, we needed a place for B-29s to fly raids against the mainland, right? It's the same thing in, in the South China Sea. You've got these islands there, but guess what? They've got a, you know, a three, four, 500 mile line of supply that has to stretch back to Hainan to get very simple things like potable water, food, medicine, you know, all these things that you need to, to garrison a force. Those things can be stopped relatively easily, right? And oh, by the way, they can't hide. <laughs> right. You know, they're, sand, they're right. sandbars in the middle of the sea. So yeah. what do you, you can't fortify them. You know, it's a billiard table. But the point is, is that for a deterrence effect, it works. And that's what I see with the Chinese and, and the Russians. It's everything is being built to deter, right? And if, and it's, again, militarily, the deterrence, that's their end state, I think, militarily with the United States. I don't think any one of the three major actors here wants to get into a shooting war with each other. But economically, culturally, socially, informationally, they're definitely on the offensive, right? I'll tell you one thing to, to keep an eye out on. You know, we've seen this with Russia using their um, their minority Russian populations, you know, in Ukraine and Crimea, Georgia, um, the Baltic states. You gotta remember the Chinese have had a very large diaspora as well in Asia. And it'll be very interesting. To me, that's one of the big indicators and warnings is are the, if the Chinese take a... Uh, a message out of that Russian playbook and start saying, well, we have to go into the Philippines because, you know, we've got 400,000 Chinese uh, living in the Philippines or whatever the number is, and we have to protect them. Because that's another very interesting thing about the Chinese is that even if you're born in a foreign country, they still view you as being a Chinese citizen first. Right. So pretty, pretty interesting. I mean, this, this is, this is hard stuff, you know, how do you, because to me, that's an intelligence problem. That's not a military problem, right? That's a social problem. That's a cultural problem. You know, the last people in the world, you want to start, <laughs> you, you don't want you using your military to try and, and, and neutralize that or, or counter that. That's an, to me, again, it's an intelligence and an economic problem. Well, let me throw this at Will then while we're talking, because this is kind of getting into his specialty. Will, as we look at these these phases of war and, and, you know, you know where I stand on this, you know, modern combat, sure, militarily dominate, but like, like Andy's saying, culturally, socially, politically, religious information, these things you can lose. And we do lose on these other facets. Um, heck, let me call them elements. These other elements of modern fight. What do we do about that? We don't have a whole lot of time. So, you know, we can only talk for so long on this, but what do we do about these other elements of combat to try to, balance the scales because we do lose these things a lot right I, I mean you never get to choose the fight you're in you can you can invest in your enemy's weakness which we have invested so much in the material side as we've been discussing like russia and china aren't going to beat us militarily but they are going to beat us using their military through the information realm uh the information domain by uh exerting influence uh, using social capacity. Um, those are things that their military is spinning up on being really good at. And our military is just, um, we're kind of hand waving it and we are, um, we're acknowledging that it's important and we're saying, okay, SOCOM is going to work with irregular warfare, but the rest of the military is not really going to try to understand that stuff. And I, I think that's, 
that's where we're going to lose. It, it might not be a tangible loss um, like geography or conflict, but we're, we're losing influence in Africa right now. Yeah. If China is able to bring in development and able to bring in market access and all we can do is, is say we're going to put a small team based out of our embassy, it, we're losing that that fight. It's not a conflict, but it's a fight. And well, it. Go ahead. You know, so sorry to interrupt. Well, I mean, it, it's interesting. You know, I, I agree with you about Africa, but what we're starting to see in in Asia is just like we're seeing a bit of a blowback now, where the Chinese have acted so aggressively, um, economically, uh, specifically, and then you know with the islands in the South China Sea is that a lot of the countries in that area are saying, well, we don't really don't trust you, China. We really don't think that your motives are, 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 are pure um, and they don't benefit us. So maybe um, it's driving them back into our camp. Yeah, it, it's funny you say that because I actually had a conversation earlier today about um, something similar. And uh, we used a phrase multipolarity earlier. Mm -hmm. I, I personally think that um, if we continue our trajectory, um, the kind of that Trumpian trajectory of taking care of ourselves and uh, moving away from that liberal world, world order, there's going to be regional cooperation agreements that rise up that can challenge us. Like um, the EU is an example. It hasn't really come, come to fruition but independent or individual European countries couldn't really compete with us economically. But as the EU, they can begin to bargain and have influence. I think we're going to see the same thing in Southeast Asia. They've um, come together with a number of different trade organizations. I'm looking through some of my papers right now, trying to find the name of one, um, uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. Yeah, ASEAN, um, right. Yeah, that that's it that's powerful and it's going to have influence beyond what it is beyond its stated purpose. And if we aren't able to understand that influence and understand why it's influential, we're, we're just playing catch up in that region. Well, it's, it's very interesting because um, I'm actually going to Vietnam with my uh, 20 of my, my peers from the, the war college class on March 29th um, to, to talk, a bunch of this strategic level stuff with the Viennese government officials um, and ASEAN, they, they actually, I think in 2020, Vietnam will have the, the leadership position of ASEAN. The Vietnamese are not happy with the Chinese, right? They fought a war in 79, um, right. but the, you know, the Chinese have been very aggressive in their offshore waters um, with their fisheries and also with oil and gas exploration. So ASEAN is sort of, it, it, it's it under you know from what what I've read about ASEAN is that the, the the leaders of the countries that compose ASEAN understand you know China is the elephant in the room and the problems that we have like you mentioned with the potential regional alliances occurring that also is is applicable to the Russians and the Chinese you know that's that one of the things that you know the Russian aggression in Ukraine especially that gave NATO a real boost of life. If that hadn't happened, I think NATO would have been dead by 2020. I really do. And it's galvanized NATO to say, look, okay, we actually do have, you know, a malign actor um, with, with Putin and he is doing things that are definitely not helpful, yeah. whether it's, you know, the, the information campaigns, the campaign meddling, um, the outright invasion of, you know, the Donetsk Basin, so it's actually given life to some of these organizations that, that wasn't there before. All right. That's a great point. Um, and hopefully they uh, invest in the right kind of things and fight the fight that um, we're seeing rather than going after these crazily expensive material. I always kind of chuckle to myself when um, I hear people start talking about the lethality task force and how they focus in on it's, it's all about killing or destruction and yeah. it's lethality. But I, I, I want it, maybe it's because I'm part of the cold of Mattis. Like I, he, I was raised in the Marine Corps while he was <laughs> a big name. But I want to think he was thinking deeper about lethality. And one of the, the sub definition of lethality has nothing to do with killing. It's about the effectiveness of, it, of an action and the affect of an action. And 
to me, that's what the, the lethality task force should be looking at. Like, are we able to get the biggest bang for our buck rather than just are we able to get the biggest bang? Like, well, um, you know, I, 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 uh, I have some inroads and insight into that. I wasn't on it, but a, a good friend of mine um, is on it right now. Uh, actually, he just left on Monday to take another job. What Mattis wanted to do with the lethality task force is he saw that historically over the, the last hundred years, the infantry takes most of the casualties. Uh, and out of the casualties, the, the most of them are coming from uh, mortars, believe it or not. Hmm. Mortars, the, mortars are the, the, the lead um, casualty producing weapon in the 20th century. And what, what he said was, look, we have to invest in our infantry. If we're pouring all this money into these high-tech systems, whether it's tanks or submarines or jet aircraft or aircraft carriers, I can take a fraction of that money and make my infantry much more lethal. I can give them better rifles. I mean, the fact that we still have an M16 derivant, you know, derivative um, blows my mind. You know, it's 50 years old now. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the M4 carbine, put many rounds through it. It's a great little weapon. But, but we should be, but we yeah. should be doing better, right? We should be doing better. Um, night vision goggles, um, you know, and, and there's some real things that I think you're going to see in the next five to seven years that are, are going to increase the actual lethality. But, Will, to your point, and I agree with you 100%, I think we have the most lethal force on the planet today, conventionally, and with our soft. To me, it's like, okay, yeah, the infantry, I, I would much rather have him call that, you know, the, the inf infantry modernization task force, because that's what he's really trying to do. Is, right. Than the lethality task force, because, you know, like the old cliche, words, words have meaning. Um, I think it gave people the wrong idea. Well, listen, fellas, we're uh, <laughs> we're at an hour, and that was an easy hour. So apparently we're going to have to do more of this. That was just fantastic, Andy. It was, it's just great to have these conversations that aren't, you know, filled with, well, heck, we're not filling the fold of gap with a bunch of tanks and artillery and waiting for the Russians. You know, it's, it's, uh, these problems are much more complex than we realize, you know, in, in the greater populace. And it's important to understand that, you know, there's really smart dudes out there like you and Will trying to figure out how do we nudge this thing in the right direction. And none of this is nudged easily. It's all, it's all big, complex policy, strategic, theoretic things that, we're trying to wrap our hands around and, and try to be prepared for the worst case scenario, but also the most likely case and, you know, pick your poison. It's just so hard to do. Well, yeah, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and, you know, I made a comment to, uh, actually I wrote an article a couple of years ago for the modern war Institute, um, up at West point where I basically said, look, after Vietnam, we completely forgot, about counterinsurgency. It was it was ripped out of everything and counter guerrilla warfare, right? But never to be studied again. We gotta focus back on 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 the Soviet Union, major power conflict, get back to inviting, you know, conventional warfare. We've kind of done the same thing today, except for one small little fact is that we're actually still fighting these kinds of wars. <laughs> right. right, right. And we refuse to be a learning organization. Refuse. Like we we yeah. Just absolutely keep, uh, we push people through. So here's our new, our new lieutenants who are going to become our new captains and we don't give them, um, actual valid mechanisms for improving their actions. We just say, this is how you do something, go execute rather than this is how you do something. And this is how you adapt to your situation, go execute. And, 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 uh, and, and why the greater context of this is why you're doing it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If if mission command is the the goal, the, the biggest part of mission command is understanding the intent. And if if there's a lieutenant who's out on his own and he's got his platoon, but he doesn't understand exactly why he's somewhere, he he can screw up the entire conflict. It's it's crew like strategic corporal, but magnified times a, a billion of how we can just completely mess things up by not understanding what we're doing yeah this is cool we got one of these strategy shows that you guys all love and so we've got colonel andy as i call him on the show he and i see the combat world in a lot of the same ways except for he actually still works trying to figure out what's next highly highly educated guy and then we're also joined by my co-host someone who's been on the show before will hardy who also works on really what's next and so we're going to try to give you all a sneak peek into the problems that we're trying to solve and, and I'm going to tell you right now, like 
from a, a <laughs> and he talked about proclivity and, and a lack of desire to serve from the next generation, Generation Z, and also like the the toll taken on personnel by our long protracted wars. So this is going to be an interesting conversation. Um, Andy, I want to start with that 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 thing of we've worn the service members out. You know, like when when people talk about females in combat, and I'll just say up front, I'm totally for it because. Everywhere I've, you know, here's, here's, as a guy that's been out of the wire as much as anybody else ever, um, here's my demands, either be a pro or trying to be a pro. If you're a woman, if you're trans, I don't care. And when people talk about injuries, I'm going to tell you who gets hurt in a combat zone, everybody. So everybody's getting hurt. They get worn out. We got seals quitting being a seal at 12, 15 years of service. And that's just like, you're so close to the finish line, but they've already reached it. Talk to me a little bit from the perspective that you work at and maybe give us an idea of what your perspective level is so the audience can track that with us. But give us an idea of what the roadmap looks like or, or as we look back to assess, what are we seeing? Yeah, sure. So right now I'm a, I'm a full-time student at the National War College at Fort McNair in uh, Washington, D.C. It's the, uh, it's the Joint and Interagency War College. So we have 50% U.S. military, 25% um, U.S. federal civilians. So we have you know, the intel agencies, we've got Department of Energy, State, Homeland Security, you, you name it. It's the alphabet soup. They're there. And then we've got 25 percent foreign officers. Um, so it's a very unique school. It's unlike any of the other war colleges. Um, uh, I, I also served for three years on the on the joint staff working for General Dunford and the, uh, the war plans division where I was the uh, the PACOM war planner. So I had the uh, the. Uh, the Korea and China portfolios, which was, was very interesting, especially with the, um, you know, when President Trump was elected and, and that, that period of very high tension uh, before the first, um, the first summit where we were escalating, uh, doing some things to, to put some pressure to get the North Koreans to the, the negotiating table. Um, and then before that, I worked for the chief of the National Guard Bureau right after he uh, was named to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So I worked directly for him on his strategic initiatives group. Uh, it's actually called the um, the Chiefs Action Group for two years. So I spent the last uh, five, six years at, at very high levels working strategy and, and uh, operational planning. Um, I went to the School of Advanced Military Studies in the Army, uh, graduated in 2010. And then I went to Afghanistan and I was actually the, uh, the lead planner for the first drawdown, which was had the wonderful euphemism, the surge recovery. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can't call it a withdrawal. It's a surge no. recovery. Right. <laughs> Recover you. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think the, uh, the, the protracted nature of the, the conflicts in the Middle East, North Africa, it's not just the people, it's the equipment, it's everything. You know, one of the things that, uh, we, we've been seeing is the, the problems with recruiting, especially for the ground forces, uh, the Marines just started uh, retention bonuses for the second time in their history. And when the Marines are offering retention bonuses, that means you've got a problem. Yeah. Because, the, Boy. because the, the, the Marines don't offer recruiting bonuses. You join to become a Marine, full stop. Uh, it doesn't matter what, what job you have in the Marines. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be a Marine. And so if they're, they're short in certain career fields, that's a really bad sign. Um, the Army is the same thing. The Navy is the same thing. The Air Force is the same thing. The Air Force is short. And you can, this is all publicly available not, um, information, by the way. Again, you can Google this up and, and find all of this out. But, you know, the, uh, the Air Force, for example, is 1,300 pilots short, Jesus. of which half of which are fighter pilots. So you have to question, you, you know, what are the dynamics where you can't fill your fighter pilots? Arguably the second most glamorous job, you know, next to astronaut in the country, you know. Is, is it an organizational culture thing? Is it an operations tempo thing? Is it the airlines offering um, a lot of money to, to become a pilot and, and work a lot less? You know, you're only working two weeks out of a month as an airlines pilot. It's probably a combination of all those things. Um, but it, it's all taken a toll. And so, you know, the last 20 years, 19 years of, of conflict, now all of a sudden you have a resurgent Russia and a rising China. So what do you have to do about them? Okay. That's why the last national military strategy 
was focused on great power competition. It's how do we take, how do we, how do we secure NATO? How do we maintain our relationship with NATO? How do we deter the Russians from any further aggression? Because the Russians' aim is quite, quite simple. They want to defend their, I mean, these are, these are traditional, you know, Russian strategy. They want to defend the near abroad because they always want to have a buffer state because they've been <laughs> pretty much invaded by everybody in Europe. Sure. And, and in Asia as well. But they also, you know, since the since NATO was created, they're always looking at ways to to divide NATO in some way. And right now, you see that most most um, potently, I think, with Turkey. You know, they want to sell advanced air air defense missiles to Turkey. That will be a real problem if that's allowed to occur. So, it's it's a really interesting state of affairs to be in the military right now at a, at a high level because there's so many different sources of pressure. Um, from so many different places. I, I absolutely agree with you, Andy, that we we aren't prepared for what's next and um, what we need to do. One of the things that I've been working on um, through my day job is really trying to understand what the competition phase means for the U.S. military and how we can actually engage in the competition phase that is uh, actually competitive with what our um, other nations are doing. So what China and what Russia may be doing fall outside of the scope of what we traditionally think of as military activities. So we're, we're having to wrestle with what can we actually do? What, what effect can we have? And are we, are we manned? Are we, do we have the technology to um, achieve that effect? And so that's, that's one of the big challenges I see coming up. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point because, you know, the um, the United States government was never designed to be inefficient, to be efficient. It was designed to be inefficient, you know, with three three competing uh, branches acting as counterbalances, right? We don't have to worry about that with Russia and China. And so, you know, with the, the Russians and the Chinese, you're right, they're doing a lot of things using their intelligence agencies, using economic power, using the power of information and propaganda, which really don't fall within what we view as, as, you know, military operations or military strategy. It's, and I think that's deliberate because they, I think they see um, the combat experience of, of the United States over the last 20 years. And they say, look, if we try and get into a, a battle of attrition, it's not going to go very well for us, you know? So where are the ways,